We need to develop a vaccine. We need to produce it and to deploy it in every single corner of the world. It's a race against time. There's little chance of beating the coronavirus without a vaccine. But when will it be ready? Scientists across the world are working around the clock to develop one, from China to the United States, Germany and Britain. New technologies are helping speed things up. More than 100 potential vaccines are in development. Some are already at an advanced stage and are being tested on volunteers. The pace may be unprecedented, but there's still a long way to go in the battle against the outbreak. The world is waiting for a vaccine. In a moment, we'll talk to the internationally renowned medical researcher Jeremy Farrar. But first, an update on where we stand. Around the world, more than 100 projects have been launched to develop a vaccine against the novel coronavirus. But it's still far from clear which candidate will succeed. BioNTech was the first German company to be approved for clinical trials. The 200 healthy volunteers taking part in the trial are receiving what's known as a gene-based vaccine. This type of vaccine introduces genetic material RNA from the pathogen into the body. The RNA tells the body cells to recreate a non-disease-causing portion of the virus, antigens. These antigens then spark the immune system into creating antibodies that fight against the real COVID-19. The biotech company CureVac, based in southwestern Germany, is also working on a vaccine like this. Amazingly, just one gram of their active ingredient could be used to create a million vaccine doses. We think this RNA technology will provide a very good and fast solution. The two companies were hoping to put their vaccine on the market this year, but they'll more likely need a year to a year and a half. Chinese firm Sinovac is meanwhile creating an inactivated vaccine. Using this more than 100-year-old method, the viruses are simply killed and introduced into the body. The danger here is that the immune system can overreact so much that it kills the person. But experiments on mice and monkeys have shown that this vaccine can be a very successful and effective solution. It's now being tested on humans as well. The advantage of an inactivated vaccine is that it's extremely simple to produce and can be done in almost any country. A team at UK's Oxford University is hoping to have a vaccine ready by September 2020. They've opted for a third method, live vaccines with viral vectors. This method uses a different, harmless virus as a vehicle. It's genetically modified so that the surface imitates the typical structure of the coronavirus, its spikes. When the virus, disguised in this way, is administered, the immune system forms antibodies that would also fight the real COVID-19. Although no one knows if the UK's active ingredient even works yet, a company in India has already started mass producing it. And I'm joined now by internationally renowned medical researcher Sir Jeremy Farrar. So very good to have you on the show. Uh, starting on an optimistic note, when do you expect we'll have a vaccine ready? Being optimistic, I would say we'll have a vaccine uh, that uh, we believe to be safe and which we're starting to see evidence it, we hope, would be protective. Uh, I would hope we would have that in the, in, the, in the fourth quarter of 2020. But that's only the start, because uh, having a vaccine at that stage is not enough to vaccinate everybody all over the world, uh, and that's where we need to work to. So, so that is going to take a few months later, and we need to do all of these things in parallel rather than uh, all in sequence to get there as quickly as we can to offer vaccines to the world. Right. You mentioned a very sensitive point there, because let's say that we do get a vaccine this year. Who is going to be in charge of distributing it, and how can we ensure that that will be fair? 
That's a great question. And, and of course, it, it has to be fair. We, we, we have to believe in a world which is equitable uh, and which access to this vaccine, because this pandemic is affecting the whole world, that this access to, the, to any vaccine is not determined by any of our abilities to pay for it. Uh, it. It isn't right, it's not fair, it's not equitable, it's not the sort of world we want to live in. So making a vaccine available to everybody, wherever they are, uh, is the crucial element here. And, and pay tribute to the German government in this, in the A support for CEPI, which is driving this process, but also the World Health Organization, who have made it very clear uh, that having a vaccine for the rich world is not enough and it's not it's not good enough. We have to commit to having a vaccine for the world. Right. And uh, the European Union certainly says that we need a global response to the pandemic. There's even an event coming up next week. Uh, how do we get everyone on the same page? It's difficult to get everybody on the same page. It's difficult at the best of times, but of course, as everybody knows, we're living in very tense geopolitical times at the moment. Uh, again, the European values, the, the values of solidarity and the values of equity and the values of a sense of fairness are absolutely critical here. And, and the role the European Commission has played alongside Germany, alongside France, alongside many of the European nations, the UK as well, uh, has very strongly argued for not just the science, not just the development, not just the manufacturing of these vaccines, but that we're absolutely committed to making this available globally. And, and the leadership from the European Commission on this has been, has been the reason we're going to be having this pledging conference next week. It would not have happened without that leadership. Right. And it's also, of course, about funding. You yourself say that the world needs at least $8 billion to get the crisis under control. Now, we've seen huge stimulus packages aimed to boost economies worth trillions of dollars. So $8 billion can't be such a big problem, can it? It isn't. I mean, the, the latest figure I heard at the weekend when joining a group of economists and um, uh, people from the Federal Reserves and, and, uh, and central banks was that the world is losing somewhere in the region of about 200 billion euros dollars a week. Um, just play that out across the whole world and play it out for just the three or four months that we've already been through, let alone the continued disruption going forward. The investment of $8 billion now, which is just the start, that will not get us to a vaccine to everybody in the world, but it will get us to the next critical stage, which is doing the science, the research, and the manufacturing of those early vaccines. It is a tiny amount of money. I cannot imagine a better investment at the moment than putting that money into science in order to develop both the, vac the vaccines and the therapeutics. When we're losing, the world is losing $200 billion a week. Uh, so $8 billion to get us out of this pandemic would be one of the best investments the world has ever made. Indeed. Now, we started this uh, on a positive note. Let's uh, get a bit more realistic, perhaps. What happens uh, if we fail to get a vaccine anytime soon? Well, that's why this uh, this conference uh, is so important, because it's not just concentrating on vaccines. It's it's vaccines, it's diagnostics, and it's also drugs and therapeutics. Uh, we need all three. Uh, I, I was a junior doctor at the start of the HIV epidemic, and many people talked in the late 1980s about how a vaccine for HIV was going to change the world, and indeed it would. But some 30 or 40 years later, we don't have a vaccine for HIV, Indeed, we don't have a vaccine for tuberculosis or malaria either. And yet, actually, through good diagnostics, through good health systems, through good public health and through having good drugs, we've been able to keep the uh, horrible pandemics of HIV, TB and malaria. Although we haven't finished those pandemics, we've, we have made great progress in bringing them under control. So there is no single magic bullet here. There is, it's not all about vaccines. It's not all about diagnostics. It's not all about drugs. It's about all of those and also uh, social sciences that brings it all together. Um, we would be unwise to put everything into the vaccine camp and not also produce the drugs and diagnostics that are required. All right, Sir so Jeremy Farrar there. Thank you so much for your time and for your input. Thank you very much. Time for some of your questions now. And today, focusing on animals. Here's our science editor, Derek Williams. Can the coronavirus spread in animals? Yes, uh, coronaviruses are what are sometimes described as being pretty promiscuous. And there's every indication that the pathogen that causes COVID-19 originated in bats and, and possibly jumped from there to another intermediate species 
before jumping on to humans, um, we now know that different species of felines can also get it and transmit it to each other. Testing with house cats showed that, and the evidence was backed up by the news that a number of lions and tigers at the Bronx Zoo in New York had contracted the disease, probably from an asymptomatic zookeeper. It's clear that we can give the virus to other animals, but it's not yet clear whether or not at least our domesticated animals can give it to us. What should I do first when I come back from walking my dog? I can't bathe him daily. In previous epidemics involving related coronaviruses like SARS, dogs owned by people who had become sick didn't grow sick themselves or transmit the virus to other humans. That seems to be holding true for COVID-19 as well. As to the question of whether SARS-CoV-2 could stick to your dog's fur, that also appears to be fairly low risk as, as hair is porous, which will tend to absorb and trap any virus. Uh, that said, when you're outside with your animal, the same social distancing rules should really apply to them as apply to us. Can I use an ultraviolet lamp to sanitize a room? What effects would that have on my body? Ultraviolet, or UV, is the short wavelength invisible radiation emitted by the sun that causes sunburn and after prolonged exposure can cause skin cancer. So high doses of it are dangerous to living things and also to viruses. We can make lights that emit those specific wavelengths, and they're often used in hospitals or labs under controlled conditions to kill microbes in the air and on, on surfaces. There are companies now selling devices for decontamination in the home, but experts at the WHO and elsewhere have warned against using them, especially when it comes to trying to sanitize, for example, your hands through direct exposure to UV light. The problem is basically that in order to damage any virus, the radiation would also have to be intense enough to, to damage you. Um, UV radiation is a potentially dangerous tool and trying to use it in the home is a lot more likely to do harm than good. Now, until there's a vaccine, the social distancing is key to keeping the pandemic under control, but that's tough around national holidays. So the Swedish city of Lund came up with a creative measure. Authorities covered the central park with chicken dung. Tens of thousands of Swedes usually gather there to celebrate Walpurgis night, but not this year, after the council spread a ton of the stinking manure on the lawns. The perfect deterrent.